Amen. Yeah, how about some applause? <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Yes. And when I say he is risen, you say he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And here we are. And one of the things that just occurred to me while the, the uh, remote choir was singing is that when uh, Jesus was raised from the dead, they didn't recognize him. Didn't recognize him. And I feel like here we are in a church a year after the Easter that we were at home. And we're in church, and it's a, a, almost unrecognizable, isn't it? But in many ways, the same. Yeah. yeah. So, new life. I don't recognize Looks... Bob with his mask over his glasses. I know, that's right. Bob, it goes over the mouth and nose. <laughs> Correct. We welcome you uh, to worship with Aldersgate Easter Sunday worship. Uh, we, today, we have about 50 people in the room, which is marvelous, and many of you joining us at home. We're so glad that you can be with us today. Uh, we encourage you, uh, if you're here, we can see you, but if you're watching remotely, uh, we ask you to go ahead and stick a comment, a good morning, a happy Easter, or like the Facebook post so that we know that you're here, because that's how we take attendance. Your favorite Easter emoji. Yes, favorite Easter. You know, you've got a theme there, buddy. You just like emojis. I like emojis, you know. That's right. Lilies, bunnies, eggs. I have a bunny queued up right in my oh, emoji. Yeah. Thread. yeah. Anyway, um, so do that so that we know you're here. Also consider sharing the post because when you share the post, then your friends who are sitting out in the back deck enjoying their coffee and the sunshine will be able to attend church, visit church, especially on Easter. What a wonderful thing to do. So an overview of this service. It's like a three ring circus this morning, Sam Fisher. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we have uh, a children's moment, and then we'll have a word of prayer and some special music. Our remote musicians, again, will uh, help us with that. A scripture lesson and the message. And then right after the message, we are receiving new members this morning into the church. New members who have come in since we have been remote, hybrid, whatever you want to call this. Uh, three new members this morning. We had a membership class a couple weeks ago with five folks on it, and three of them said that they'd like to join today. And what's going to be especially cool for people in the room, online you won't notice it as much, but for people in the room, one of the members is joining via Zoom. So she'll be up on the wall, and two of them are here in person. So that's something to look forward to. Never done that before. Nope. It's all improv. And then after that, we'll celebrate Holy Communion. For people in the room, uh, you have these little cups. Uh, at your seats. We will not be moving around, uh, we, right? You'll be staying in your seats, and, and I will give you the prompts for this. If you're at home, please go get um, something like bread and juice to celebrate Holy Communion. And then after that, we'll have uh, time for giving our gifts and announcements and a final song. The final song this morning is uh, over 400 singers, United Methodists all over the world contributed to create a virtual choir, and three of our own choir members are in that virtual chorus as well. So you'll be able to see some familiar faces in that final number. We look forward to it. Okay, so that is our plan. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we are so delighted to be here. Some of us, God, in this room haven't been to a worship service in over a year in this building and we give you thanks we give you thanks for new life god for even when it's unrecognizable god that you keep creating that you keep redeeming that you keep raising us into new things god for everyone within the sound of my voice i pray that they would feel welcome and a part of this service no matter where that they are or when they are watching, God, that your spirit would accompany them and that this hour would be used to strengthen and encourage and inspire us, God, uh, so that we can go out into the world that needs your love so much and share that in Christ's name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right. So there's a time with the children and... Usually it's our kids on their screens kind of in that area. Yeah, on a, on a regular remote Sunday, our children are over there gaming. <laughs> but today they're paying strict attention. So for the third time during the season of Lent and Easter, I have brought my plant to show to you. My plant has been growing and growing. Do you know that it did a new thing in there's the a, last week? There's a bonus plant. Yeah, there's an extra plant that sprung up about a week ago. There's it's, two for the, for the longest time, now there's a third one. Yeah, first we had twins, and then we had another one that came later on. It was fascinating. This plant, I planted the seeds for on Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of the season of Lent, the season of preparation for Easter. And when we planted these seeds, they looked... I actually didn't have the actual seeds, but they looked a lot like this. Let's see if I can show you in the camera. This is a lentil. 
Oh, you see that little tiny seed? If you've ever seen a dry lentil, that's what they look like, about that big. And you know, if I saw one of these dry lentils, if like it was just on the floor in my, in my kitchen or something, I'd be like, oh look, a rock. Oh look, that's nothing. Oh look, something I need to sweep up or wait for Sam to come along. Sam's the one who likes to sweep in our house. Sam will sweep that up later. <laughs> I like the countertops clean. He likes the floor clean. It's a, it's a good match. Anyway, but I would think that's nothing, that little bump, that little dry, hard thing. There's nothing there that's dead. It's inconsequential. But when we planted the seed inside the dirt six and a half weeks ago, we were saying, we don't believe that that seed is inconsequential. We believe that something's coming from that. There's potential in that seed. Something new can come from that seed. And we planted it in the dirt, and then we watered it, and everybody stared at their pots for like days and days and Nothing said... Nothing happened. That's right. And people said, mine didn't plant yet. People were posting and on Facebook. Some overachievers were like, I've got this. Mine already sprouted. Shirley. Shirley's here. Shirley's was first. She was like, look at mine. And I'm like, oh, well... She wasn't. She, she's more righteous than ever. No, no, no teasing. Well, and I told the people who were waiting and waiting for their seeds. And this one, I'm telling you, this one took four weeks. I must have planted it super deep is the problem. Waiting and waiting, I said, well, you have to have a little bit more faith, you know, wait on God a little longer. Look at what was inside those seeds. Look at everything that came out of something that just looked like a bump, like nothing, like a piece of trash. I think that is such a beautiful metaphor for God working in our lives, that sometimes there's a piece or a part of our life or maybe a person or a relationship or an opportunity. It looks like nothing. It looks like it doesn't matter at all. And yet it is so full of potential. God has hidden something inside of there that if given some time and some water and a nice pot and a little sun and some prayer and some faith, it can grow into something entirely new. That is so exciting to me, that, that life is just not predictable, that you don't know what's going to come out of something that looks like nothing. God knows, but we don't know. And so Easter is one of the days, the resurrection day is one of the days that we can remember that God brings living things out of things that appear dead or things that are dead, right? You could argue that a seed yeah. is dead, right? God brings living things and that God surprises us all the time by bringing something new out of a thing that, that we never, ever would have predicted. So if you are there at home, you are going to remember that when we celebrate Easter, we love our Easter baskets. Who got Easter baskets? I'm looking in the room. Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. apparently you don't have to be young to get an Easter basket. Just young at heart. Young at heart, young yes, at heart. a lot of people. It's fun to get the Easter baskets. We love the chocolate, that's good. But the most important message about Easter is new life coming out of death, kind of like that plant that has been growing out of those tiny little dry seeds that look like nothing. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we're so thankful that you surprise us that you bring new life, new things that we couldn't have known from situations that we thought only showed us death. God, we ask that you would continue to show us this. Be people who believe in it and look for it, God, and who are patient for it. And when that new life comes around, that new thing, we can say thank you, God, and praise God because you have blessed us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, the virtual choir comes zooming in from the corners of the world. Uh, one more piece of special music this morning. Sorry, technical difficulties, one second. Uh, I think it's funny that it ended on the word waiting. 
All right. Well, we will we will wait yeah. now that yeah. we're on this issue. I will tell a quick story while we're waiting. Yes. Oh, we're, no one can see us there. I forgot that. Um, can we turn that back on? We recorded this with our kids, and we said, "Everybody, come sing. We're all going to sing melody." And we went into the room, and boy, did the boys grumble and scowl. But they did just fine. They did beautifully. We never hear our boys sing, so we're. <laughs> but it was so good because we don't usually have opportunities for the family to sing together. And so some of the voices you are hearing are our very well voiced but begrudging singing sons. Are we ready? Uh, I had something very unexpected happen. Um, yeah, give me a minute. All right. Well, I think we're going to probably, are we going to try one more time? Daniel, uh, this, is, this is a problem on your end. So we're going to give you one more minute, and then we're going to move on from this song. Bobby, also, I have a low battery. Um, this is the time for the technical difficulties. Usually, we would be going to commercial break at this point, people. <laughs> <laughs> are you hungry? Is it the second Saturday of the month? Because Aldersgate has a great free breakfast. Great free breakfast. That's right. It it's, hopefully it's served in your own kitchen in your own home. <laughs> <laughs> For right now, after quarantine. We, we did have a great Easter egg hunt yesterday, I'll say, and thank you to all the volunteers who helped put that together. And yeah, it was the youth group. Came through, youth group decorated the hallway here, and it was yep. gorgeous. And that's why we had the sidewalk chalk greeting you um, as you came in the building, as they were doing some decoration out there. So I yeah. thought that went really well. Lots of beautiful little baby children with Easter eggs. There's nothing better. Yes. Yeah. All right. So let us see if um, Daniel is ready. And if not, then we'll just see if we'll do it later. We need to stay in touch on the chat. How you feeling, Daniel? I got it, I got it, sorry about okay, that. Yeah. All right, Here we go. take it away.
just very quickly take a look at the back corner of the room and the front corner of the room. This is how the virtual choir happens. People singing right into uh, their computers. That's how it works week to week. We appreciate each and every one of you. The scripture lesson this morning, it comes from the Gospel of John, the account of the resurrection as written by John and read this morning by Calvin Fisher. This account of the resurrection comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached, into the, reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying, lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the term first, also went inside. He saw and believed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. The account of the gospel. Thank you, Calvin. It's beautiful. Well, we say one more time to you, Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It's wonderful to have all of you here together in the building and so many people joining from all, all across the world and on, well, the world. That's lofty. Well, your brother's in Minnesota. It's a whole different world out there. Well, that's true. Yes, good morning, Uncle John. Um, and friends on Facebook and on Instagram, if you are here, uh, please drop an emoji, a comment, a like, and then we'll know that you visited this morning. We pray that God feels present to you no matter when you're watching this or where you are. We've just heard John's account of the resurrection. Oh my gosh. I will tell you what, I am feeling some resurrection in April of 2021. Amen. Okay, oh, good. Amen. That's why Sam's here to say amen. I'm, but, I'm the hype guy. Yeah, Rachel, <laughs> that's right. Uh, amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. But I think you all want to say amen about some things too, because this week in North Reading, our elementary kids went back to school, all of them in school, every day, a week, uh, every day of the week. Can I get an amen? Amen. Right. That's a, oh, and some applause from parents, yeah. right? Yeah. And we have an amen because right here in the front right of the church, as well as me and Sam and maybe a couple others, these are people who've received their vaccines. Let's say amen. 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 We love it. We have, we've called this, between George and I, I've called this the loge seating. And that's for, <laughs> for those who've been vaccinated may sit, sit right next to each other, just like that. We say amen. The weather is warming up. Amen. Amen. Uh, Bob Kingsley tells me that traffic was normal on 114 yesterday when he went to go pick up the lilies. How about an amen for normal traffic? Amen. <laughs> no, oh, okay. <laughs> Weren't as unanimous yeah. on that one. But what about having a full church? Amen. Oh, it feels so good. It feels so good. It's been lonely, my friends, and we have held it down up here, and some of you have come occasionally, but just to see your faces is a wonderful thing. So I'm feeling like I understand the resurrection this morning because there's so much that makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. Well, no. Because you want to know something? The resurrection is not about feeling happy today. Hmm. Feeling happy is a really nice side effect, but it isn't just the normal progression of the rolling out of the vaccines or the normal warming of the temperatures here in the Northern Hemisphere. It isn't just that that tells us the story of the resurrection. These things happen as a matter of course, and we feel glad and we say thank you, God, but that is not the power of the resurrection. We haven't found it yet. So let's get there. How do we get to the difference between being happy at seeing new and good things happen and the power that comes behind the resurrection? So I wanna move first to what most of us have been doing for the past 13 months, which is binge watching shows. We got any binge watchers out there? Any Netflix, Netflix YouTube? Yes. Thank God that the streaming media came online just a couple years before this pandemic because we have been able to watch, you know, exactly what we want to watch, when we want to watch it because of all these platforms. And we know that the shows are great. 
while we're watching them, but we know that they're excellent and amazing when they end well. Yes. Nothing worse than a disappointing ending to one of those series that you, you've been de you know, dedicated, watching three or four episodes a night for a week, and you've got to find out what happens. And at the end, you're like, what? That wasn't very good. It's so like in 2018. I never watched the show, but I had friends and our neighbors. They loved this show. It was based on a book series called Game of Thrones. Any Game of Thrones people out here? Game and the first season was fantastic. It's kind of violent. It was super Second buzzy. season was really good. And then it went and crapped the bed at the end. <laughs> it was that wasn't terrible. Like, I had coworkers who like, it happened just how they said it would happen. And I had coworkers who were like, I wasted so much of my life. Right, like it was great in the middle of it, but the end yep. left so much to be desired. I remember people felt the same way about The Sopranos ending, not so happy, very divided public on the end of The Sopranos. Seinfeld, right? Meh. Yeah, they all right? went to jail. Yeah. And they had all their friends testify in court about how terrible they were as people. And you're like, and I watched that show and I thought it was funny. Right. So you're in the middle of it and you're liking it and you get to the end and if the end isn't done well, all of a sudden it colors the whole rest of the thing. Yes, it was like that one like, um, superhero movie where the bad guy did the little snap at the end that one and then the hero. movie was over. And you're like, wait, half the people on Earth died and because the bad guy won? It just made no sense. That's not the end! That's what you're saying, right? Oh, a bad ending, just absolutely no good. So what, what, what of the endings are dissatisfying to us is that we don't see justice. We don't see resolution. We don't see hope. There's series that have great endings. We just finished watching Shit's Creek about a month ago or so, and everyone said, oh, it's just a wonderful show, wonderful show. And the end, I cried so much. They said I was so sorry it was over. The ending of it was so good that I was happy to have watched the end because they did it perfectly because there was restoration and redemption and you know, the main character goes off with the love of his life and it's just, you know, people have grown. It's wonderful. You see that redemption, that healing and that, that new thing happening with them. I wonder why it is that in our heart of hearts, we prefer that happy ending. Why we're so much more satisfied when the stories end on a, on a theme of justice and reconciliation. Because is that real life? Is life always like that? To end on a happy note with a musical number and everybody dancing and a little marriage and a sunset? Is that really what life is like? No, the next season happens and Tom Brady moves to Florida. You're like, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the thing what a we had. Terrible covered. ending. <laughs> I know. Thank you. That was that was also bad in rehearsal. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness, I lost where I was because that was such a good thing <laughs> that you just said. <laughs> no. Um, because it certainly seems like life could be very circular. Right? They even call it the circle of life, that it's just one big cycle and it just repeats over and over again. And there are parts of the world that tell stories this way, a very circular way, no forward progress, but just repeating and repeating. Or you could go with the you know, natural scientists, and we believe in science, we love science, we believe that science describes the world that God made. But physicists tell us that everything tends towards disorder. Right? That's one of the thermodynamic laws. Yeah, it's like my teenager's room. <laughs> You're on fire today, I am. buddy. Yeah. He does a good job cleaning up when his girlfriend is going to come over. So. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't think that she sees his room, honey. That's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? yeah. No, but decay is one of the forces in the universe. Right. You go to bed tonight, and tomorrow you wake up sore from doing nothing, just from sleeping. Because you aged. You are decaying. Can you tell how old we are? We have definitely hit middle age, so we wake up tired. Yes. But if those are ways of telling stories, why doesn't that resonate with us in the same way? Why do we want this happy ending? Just so that we can feel good? Feel? Maybe? I want to suggest to you that the reason it is so much more satisfying to have a good ending, a, a just ending, a resolved ending to a story where we see new life, where we see healing and wholeness, is because this story, read to us this morning by the, from the Gospel of John, this story of Christ's resurrection from the dead was like a sonic boom that went off in world history, and its ripple effects continue today. That that story... The story that 
after the most certain and sure thing that any of us ever know, right, is death and taxes, right? So one of two. Um, the most certain thing, the end of life. They witnessed the end of Jesus' life. The story is over. That is clear. Everybody understands that. It's disappointing. That's real life. Okay. But when those women go to the tomb and they see that he is gone and they don't know what to make of it, and then when he begins to appear to his disciples in this new form, this unrecognizable form, takes them a minute, but they, they realize it's him. When that happens, all of a sudden, the certainty of death is not so certain anymore. The certainty of the end of the story is that it is not, in fact, over, that God has more to say and more to do. And when that story happened when that event happened and the story began to be told across the world it changed us friends because instead of seeing life as circular and repeating or tending towards decay and despair we said well there are moments that it seems like there's no progress there are moments that it seems like it's over absolutely but christ rose from the dead and god can still do things and therefore we continue to move forward and so that's why you mentioned the Avengers movie, right? The, the, this, it was a huge movie. Everyone thought it was the last movie, and it ends with half the world dying. Yeah. And people cried out in the theater. Sam was in the theater. They yelled. They were so angry that the, the guy, story The had guy ended. next to us swore out loud. I don't say it. I was afraid you are going to be like, and then he said, no, boom. No, no. Yeah, because <laughs> it was so upsetting because we know that's not it. That's not how we tell stories. Christ has risen. The story isn't over. Let's keep going. Let's keep going in hope and in faith and see what God will do next. But this isn't just about how to create a good selling Netflix series or a nice satisfying Hollywood movie. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God tapping into something that is deep inside of us, something that allows us to look out at the natural world, look at the, at the beautiful little plant that I showed the children this morning and say, there is new life coming. I see it all around me in the world as I observe the world. And now Christ has shown me that this is true for people too, right? Blows the hinges off the doors of death. I have a contemporary story to share with you about the power of the resurrection, not just a happy day, a good story where I felt good, but the actual power of the resurrection alive and at work in the life of a family here locally. There was a couple, North Reading High School, a few years back. He was on the football team. She was a cheerleader. cheerleader. Yeah, she was a year younger, started dating, sweet relationship. They but, lived over by Bob Kingsley. Uh, yeah, lived over by Bob Kingsley. And um, I wonder if they got to meet Bob. I don't think they overlapped, is oh, my okay. guess. All right. Well, anyway, that's off topic. But the point is, they fell in love high school, decided that they were going to get married. They have a beautiful little town, North Reading. We love it. It's a beautiful American love story. The wedding is over. They think about starting a family. Now, if you have a had asked them, what would you like your story to be? How would you like your story to play out? Both of them would have said, well, you know, we're hoping to have a couple kids, you know, and, you know, hopefully we can have stable jobs, maybe give back. They went to church in North Reading, uh, go to church and, you know, make the, make the world a little bit of a better place. Maybe when we have our 25th anniversary, we'll go on a cruise, right? Retire, meet some grandkids. That's what we'd like. That's the story. And everybody would agree that's a good story. But when their first child was born, when they brought this baby home from the hospital, there had been a complication with the birth. The oxygen, uh, the cord had been wrapped around the baby's neck, and they came home with a child who could not control its muscle movement. They didn't know what was wrong. Um, but they hoped, they hoped that every day, every morning when they woke up, they hoped, well, maybe today the child will start progressing. Maybe this child will get stronger and, and look a little bit more like a normal baby. And as the child grew, you know, one month, two months, three months, nothing's changing. And what a period of despair. Talking about being disappointed, Tom Brady moving. I mean, this is actually really, like, yeah. this isn't the life that we had planned. Like, this isn't how I saw things. Where is God right now? Like, I'm suffering, I'm struggling. Should we even... You know, are we even going to have any more children if our children, like we, he's sick. 
there's something wrong. And they consulted with the doctors, and the doctors said, this baby um, is, is just never going to improve. Uh, we recommend, you know, the baby probably will never speak, uh, probably mentally handicapped as well. We recommend that you institutionalize your son. And the dad wasn't going to have any of that. He said, nope, he's going to grow up in our house. And um, Can I tell it? Yeah. Because I wanted to come up. Okay, good. I have a very important order of how Oh, I yes, yes. Duet sermons are a little complicated. When you both have I love punchlines. Yeah. Get to the punchline. Am I going too slow? No, no. Okay. Keep it, I keep can it, speed it up. No, no, no. Sure. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. It's just an outline. I can skip right over some details if you like. They have two more children, which itself is an example of hope and optimism. They keep their son at home, and as they observe him with his two brothers, I believe, dad starts to notice, he says, I think this kid is smart. He hasn't said anything, um, but I can see the way he interacts with the world, and I think that he's intelligent in there. I don't think that he's gonna be a vegetable like they said he was going to be. And you know, he couldn't go to school or anything because they just couldn't make out what was going on. So he says, I'm gonna teach him the alphabet. Together, we're gonna teach him the alphabet. Somebody just understood whose story I'm telling. Somebody said, oh, <laughs> I heard it. And so he did, taught his son the alphabet. And very, very slowly, this child learns how to communicate. When the child was about 10 or 11 years old, they had some friends, and the friend worked in a computer place, and they figure out this computer so that this child can now use the computer to uh, spell out letters instead of his alphabet yeah, system. Yeah, if he nods at something, yeah, it, it would movements, pick the letter like or whatever. Mm -hmm. They diagnosed cerebral palsy by that time. And the child learns how to use this communication device. They call it the hope machine. The very first thing the child says, go Bruins. <laughs> how do you like that? It wasn't I love you, Dad. It was go Bruins. Go Bruins. <laughs> but now the parents know that the child has a passion for sports, which yes. is great. OK, this is a kid. He's coming along. He starts to go to public school they, here in the North Reading schools. And then a little while later, uh, one of the kids in his class was injured in a really bad lacrosse accident and was paralyzed. And this boy understood that deep in his heart. He understood he felt a great deal of empathy. And he said, I want to do something, Dad, about this. I want to help. Well, there was a benefit for the, the paralyzed child. Is it a 5K? Five mile run. Oh, five miles. There's a difference between 5K and 5M, just so oh, you know. Yes, there is. It's brutal. <laughs> you don't want to get that one wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Five miles. That's actually why I put that very clearly. Yeah. Yeah, five miles. Well, obviously, this boy can't run. So he says to his dad, would you push me? Now, dad's not a runner. He's not in bad shape. He's not an old guy or anything, but he's not a runner. And he thought, well, my kid wants me to do this. It means so much to him. He said, OK, so he does some training and things. And he pushes this kid on a five-mile race with a benefit. The mom and dad, when they brought that baby home, looked at him and looked at, like that little lentil seed that I held up for the kid, looked at something that should have had no hope, no potential, no possibility. And they said, this story is not over. And we're going to see what we can do. And we're going to see if there's a new story to tell. And when that father and son ran and were pushed for that five-mile race, it was the very first of 1,100 endurance race that Dick and Ricky Hoyt would run. There was another story. The story wasn't over for them. The, from between um, 1977, which is when they ran that road race, and 2016, 1,100 races, 72 marathons, 32 of which were Boston marathons, six Ironman competitions. This is the long-distance triathlon. The first time Ricky said that he wanted to do a, an Ironman, Dad was a very poor swimmer and hadn't been on a bike since he was, he was six years since old. Since he was six. <laughs> So they had to figure out like a little trailer for the bike and then how to have a raft that he could drag while swimming. And he came in like second to last, the I think, the first, the first triathlon. triathlon. But six Ironman competitions. They became motivational speakers. They traveled around the world. They wrote a book all about inclusion of paralyzed children, about what is possible um, not only with the strength and support of community, which they began to gain. At first, people thought they were weird. 
um, but the, not only with the support of the community, but because of their faith background as well, with the strength and the grace of God. Their story was not over. There was another chapter. And it wasn't the story that they would have written for themselves. That's the thing, and that's where the difference, that's where the, the power of the resurrection comes in. There's some stories that we tell ourselves, especially as Americans, that like, I have this dream, I view success this way, I have a great amount of strength and self-reliance, I'll, I'll pull myself up by my bootstraps, I'll do it, I'll make it happen. When you start to see the power of the resurrection in someone's life, it's, it's when it becomes not your story, but a story that God writes that you never could have imagined, a story that emerges out of suffering, a story that is transformative, that produces something new that you could have never imagined, and a story that does not rely on your power to complete, but a story that requires the power of God. This is how we know the story of the resurrection. Not when we just have, a, have a, a nice day with good weather and some sort of success like having 50 whole people at church. That's not it. It's when through suffering, like Christ's suffering on the cross, that the story changes and we can't believe and we don't know what's going to happen and that suffering transforms us. So we say, God, I don't have the story anymore. I want to be part of your story. Show me what you can do here. And God writes a new thing. And God supplies God's power to make it happen. Team Hoyt, Dick and Ricky Hoyt. Dick just passed away last month. His funeral will be uh, just in a few weeks at the Congregational Church here in North Reading. Uh, Ricky went on to finish high school. He went to BU, majored in computer science, got a job with computers where he helps to develop computers and software that um, help paralyzed individuals like himself. This guy was supposed to be a vegetable. The doctor said, vegetable. And now the father and son joke, I don't know, what kind of vegetable do you think I am? <laughs> I do like that. A new story, God's story, born of suffering and born of the power of the Holy Spirit transforming people's lives. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I am fired up because we're going to do a thing we've never done before. Speaking of new stories and new things, um, we have three people who are joining the church today. Uh, we have Lana, Robin, and Kathleen. We need to do a little bit of a set change up here and to bring um, Kathleen onto camera. So I've asked Daniel to play just a little bit of music, and I'll invite the lady. Well, here we are, and Robin, I'm going to ask you just to scoot a little over to your right as well. We, now everything has to be staged for cameras. It's like a whole nother level, a whole new story. But I have with me here uh, Robin Wilson and Lana Davies, and I think there's Kathleen. Do you want to uh, prioritize her screen there so we can see? And Kathleen Epstein joining us on Zoom. Marvelous. So I asked them if they would first spend just a quick minute um, introducing themselves. So why don't we have Kathleen go first. Uh, Kathleen, if you want to unmute, um, tell us who you are. We got to meet you last week on the five and five interview, so some people might remember hearing that. But uh, tell us who you are and how you found the church, Kathleen. Uh, my name is Kathleen Epstein. I'm from Roslindale, Mass. And I found the church through Bobby Pierce. That's right. And you started watching on Facebook Live, Kathleen. And uh, yes. you live in Roslindale, you said. Yes. Yeah. And someday we're going to meet you in person. 
Well, it would have been nice if it was today, but uh, due to me being in the hospital, yeah, that that didn't happen. Yeah, but like I'm still here on Zoom. You are, and that counts because this is the way the world is now, and we believe it. Um, you got home from the hospital this morning, Kathleen, and we appreciate your real commitment to being here, uh, given everything that's going on. Thank you. And it was yesterday I came home, but that's okay. All right, that's fine. All right, and I will ask Robin to introduce herself and your husband, Michael. I, I've also told Robin and Lana they can take off their masks. They're vaccinated, and I'll just keep mine on. Thank you. Um, my name is Robin Wilson, and I'm from North Reading. And I came to this um, wonderful uh, community, faith community, through D. Kymac, who's an old, young, um, sorry, <laughs> um, longtime <laughs> friend of mine. We grew up together, and um, D. was affiliated with this wonderful parish and said, um, you would love it. This is exactly what you would what would be fulfilling for you. I had been searching for something, a part of a uh, spiritual community for several years and the pandemic really gave me this wonderful opportunity and started to watch the 715 and called D and said, you're right, this is for me. These are my people and I couldn't be more blessed. Yeah. Thank you. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. And your husband, Michael, is here supporting this he decision, this step in your life, which we love. He is, he's wonderful. All right, Lena. Hi, I'm Lana Davies, and I moved to North Reading nine months ago from Florida. I was there for four years. Uh, previously, most of my life, I lived in Missouri. Well, we're so glad to have you, and you came because of a new grandbaby, Charlotte. Yes, yes. yes. I was ha uh, my first uh, grandchild was born, and I always said that I would live close. So. Fantastic. Well, we're so glad we have gained because of your granddaughter. All right, so those of you uh, seated here in the building, you have uh, hymnals on your seats, and that is so that we can go through the membership ceremony together. Uh, we had, like, again, a good meeting about a week and a half ago on Zoom and went through all these questions uh, with the three ladies at that time. Uh, the page number is, uh, the part that you will read starts on page 35, and that's the Apostles' Creed, which is written out in case you don't have it by memory. All right, Kathleen, I see you up there, so I'm talking to you too. <laughs> I've never done this before. So to Kathleen and Robin and Lana, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your own sin? All right, we'll, we'll hear an I do from Kathleen. I do. There we are. Okay. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. All right, and this is the top of page 35, friends. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these people now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them, that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of skins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. These three ladies have all been members of other churches prior to this, and all three have been baptized. Uh, that would be the next step if you had not. Um, so we remember that. And baptism makes you a member of Christ's universal church, that family tree that we talked about, in our, right? That means you belong to all the church. But as members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? I will. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? I will. And now I'm on page 38 at the bottom, friends. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And may the God of all grace, Kathleen, Robin, and Lana, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Congratulations. Why don't you go through my hand? There you are. God bless you guys. This is when I hug you. Hug, hug. Okay. Air hug. Air hug. All right. What a wonderful thing. And now uh, we have one more set change as we uh, move to communion. Um, for those of you at home, we just ask that you would get bread and juice. And for those of you here, make sure you have one of the individual serving cups uh, provided at the at the door. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefied, and unfailing. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, and he was recognized by his disciples by the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on the gifts anywhere of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Church, with the Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. I invite you to take your bread or your wafer. This is the body of Christ. And I invite you to take the cup. This is the cup of salvation. Amen. love when we celebrate the Lord's Supper after receiving new members. I think it's so beautiful that the first thing that we do together is to share in that meal. And again, we welcome Lana, Kathleen, and Robin. All right. Well, it is uh, time for us to give our gifts to God here on site. Uh, there is an offering plate out in the foyer uh, on your way out or your way in. You can drop something there. And for those online, there's a link that's been put into the comments. Uh, we appreciate so much the gift that you give to the church. We appreciate our regular givers, our pleasures, and everyone who's able to give a gift today. Uh, there is a special category in the online giving uh, for an Easter gift. If you want to give a, a gift, especially in the honor of the resurrection, you may do that by selecting that category, my Easter gift. Thank you. All right, for announcements... Um, I don't, he is risen. That's where I am. He is risen indeed. <laughs> no. Don't ask a pastor what they're doing the Monday after Easter. The pastor has no idea because everything is just resurrection. That's it. And can't see anything beyond it. Uh, but actually, uh, coming up this weekend on Saturday night, we have the final uh, cook-along of the series. This has been a fundraiser we've been doing, a cooking show on Zoom, uh, where when you make your payment, your donation, uh, you get to see the Zoom link and be on a class uh, learning how to do something special this month. It is grilling tic trips. <laughs> oh, I grilling can't. tips with Eric Evans. <laughs> tips and tricks. It's going to be awesome. Easy for me to say. Yeah, and Eric, Eric. He's like a self-taught culinary cooking genius. Well, and if you haven't seen him in person, Eric has lost like 25 pounds during COVID. We still love him. We're proud of him. We're yeah. not envious, right? We're proud of him. Uh, he wants to focus on healthy grilling. So he's not only grilling meats, but veggies as well. Yes. That's this Saturday night. And in your church email that you received this morning, there were links about that, as well as um, our final raffle, which is for a Cinco de Mayo basket. We're already cheering for Bonnie because that's Bonnie's birthday, the Cinco de Mayo. The raffle drawing is this Saturday, though. So if you are interested in that, um, uh, please, that's another way to support the church through the fundraising efforts. Um, we appreciate that. All right, so those are the announcements that we have for celebration and thanks this morning. Oh, my goodness. Did I ever announce that you could put your prayer requests in the comments? I don't think you did, but a couple of people did. People know. Yes. They know how to do that. And some people So next, next week, when you're, if you're here, that's great. But if you're at home watching, you can put your prayer requests in the comments that's on right. Facebook. That's how we know what it is. Um, 
Yes, so before we move right to that, um, celebration and thanks. This morning I have two. Uh, one, and you mentioned it earlier, is um, to thank those, all those who put on the Easter egg hunt yesterday. It's a tremendous amount of work, but it, the leader of that was Elaine Tanner, who had been working on it for, for weeks, planning it all out, and then pulled it off this, uh, this Friday and Saturday. So let's give some special re recognition to it. It was really something. It was really something. Yes. We appreciate it. And, and we left one part of it up in the um, narthex so you can take a picture by the side. It yes. says, Jesus loves you. Yep, that was the, the final thing that yes. people saw before they left the building yesterday. So we appreciate Elaine. And also, I just wanted to say one more time how much I appreciate uh, George Schofield and Kevin Spicer. They were here this morning at 8 in the morning setting up the chairs. We had a sign seating here in the room, people's name tags on their chairs, hymnals, communion cups, all of it. They've helped bring the lilies. They so if you want a better chair next time, talk to those guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there's any problems, talk to them. Well, we just appreciate that they were like, we will be there first thing Easter Sunday morning and get that room squared away. So let's thank George and Kevin. Okay, I believe that it is time for our final prayer, and then we get to see the 400-person virtual choir of United Methodists from all around the world. Amen. Amen. All right, do you have any uh, an email? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. God, this has really been such a joy, so refreshing to be able to be together with church family in this room and also to realize one more time, God, that you connect us in very vital ways um, through all the technology, God. What a thing we've witnessed to um, have a new member of the church join who hasn't been with us in person. God, you're teaching us a new thing. And we ask that you would continue to go with us and guide us as we figure out what this new thing is all about. God, you've inspired us with the uh, story of the resurrection, reminding us that you transform our stories from suffering to stories of inspiration uh, through power that only you can bring. God, I pray that each person would leave here today encouraged and uplifted, knowing that you walk with us every step of the way through times of suffering and times of healing and times of resurrection. God, we have many prayer requests among us this morning. First, we pray for those we're concerned, and as always, God, we pray for those who are struggling with or in recovery from addiction, and for those with mental illness, depression, and anxiety. God, we ask that you'd pour out your healing and keep people safe. We pray for those with long-term illnesses, Michael Boucher's parents, Barbara Schinnebarger, and Joe Connors, as well as Maria LaRose's friend, Marie Patrice, who is in hospice. We pray for healing for Jen Davis after a surgery this last Friday. God, we pray for um, two, uh, where we thank you for uh, the life of Anne Tamlin, who is Jane Tamlin Hayden's mother, passed away this week, and we ask that you would bring comfort to her family. We pray for um, Annie Berkeley's father, Ed Berkeley, to get stronger and to come home from rehab. He's 85 years old. God, the joys. Among us this morning are so many. Um, specifically today, we celebrate that Adam Tanner was accepted into the Tufts Fine Arts Program. Um, we rejoice with that family. We continue to be grateful, God, for all those working so hard during the pandemic, especially for those in the schools. We uh, celebrate the reopening of the elementary schools this week to all students, all days, and ask that you would continue to help those as they work towards middle school and high school doing the same thing. And finally, God, today, again, thank you for the um, astonishing uh, sonic boom of a message of life after death that the story is not over. God, uh, help us to hang on to that. God, you've heard all of our prayers. We ask now that you would hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Did you hear that? Yeah, we haven't heard that. We haven't heard 50 people say that together in a really long time. Beautiful. All right, Daniel, we send it over to you. God bless you all. Thank you for joining. And uh, thank you all for those who were able to come for being here as well.